Major support for these programs is provided by Bank of America, Merrill Lynch, and Perfect Building Maintenance, New York Community Bank, All Nation Renovation, Kilroy Architectural Windows, New York's Window Company, Greenberg Traurig, LLP, M&T Bank. Additional support is provided by AVR Realty Company, LLC, Ackman Ziff Real Estate Group, LLC, Bingham McCutcheon, LLP, Briarwood Organization, Capital One Bank, C.B. Richard Ellis, James Orfanides, Centurion Holdings, Cushman and Wakefield, Dimes Savings Bank of Williamsburg, Douglaston Development, DDG Partners, Eastern Consolidated, Hal Fetner, Durst Fetner Residential, Friedman LLP, Accountants and Advisors, Gemini Real Estate Advisors LLC, Genova Burns and Gian Tomasi, Grubb and Ellis, Investors Savings Bank, Jack Jaffa and Associates Real Estate Consultants, James D. Kuhn Real Estate Institute at Syracuse University, Madison Realty Capital, Massey Knackle Realty Services, Meridian Capital Group, Margolin Weiner and Evans LLP, Certified Public Accountants and Business Advisors, Newmark Knight Frank, RAL Development Services, The Spandrel Group LLC, Siami Development, SJP Properties, Site Comply, Sterling and Sterling, Stephen Napolitano, The Wickhoff Group, Urban American. There are people who create unique things. There are people who come up with the idea of extended stay hotels. There are people who come up with this idea of short-term rentals. And where do these people come from? They come from Philadelphia. And today, I'm fortunate to have the chairman and CEO of Corman Communities, AKA Hotels, AVA Communities, my good friend, Stephen Corman. Thank you very much, Michael. So Stephen, your great grandf your great grandfather Hyman, my grandfather. Okay, your grandfather Hyman came over in like 1900, originally in New York, but then settled in Philadelphia. That's so, correct, Michael. So tell me about uh, Hyman and Yetta. They were wonderful people. Uh, there was a love affair. They had many letters to each other while she was still in Russia, and he came over, and like so many other immigrants. Uh, he had the opportunity to say, what, what can I do here? And he became a dress designer he, for women's clothing. He, he cut patterns. And his wife, when she came over, they saved money. They lived in a farm in northeast Philadelphia. So how did he end up into a farm? I mean, here's a man who's really cutting patterns and selling the patterns to people in New York and, and Philadelphia and other places. How did he decide to become a farmer? I really don't know at that point exactly, but if I had a bet, I would say Yetta had a lot to do with it. Uh, I think that they wanted to live out in, the, in a farm. She was comfortable in a farm. Uh, they were raising three children, and she saved every penny he made and they bought ground. So, so what happens is Grandpa Hyman and Yera, and Hyman creates in 1909 the Hyman Corman Inc. That's correct. And Hyman Corman Inc., the, this Russian immigrant, comes here and he starts building row houses in northeast Philadelphia. Tell me what a row house is. In well, it was interesting. Actually, his first homes were twins. They were two homes connected. Uh, and I, I love his original ads that I've seen that were in the Philadelphia Bulletin and then the Philadelphia Inquirer were almost apologetic. Uh, they were saying, you know, we're giving you this five-bedroom stone house, four fireplaces, with everything you could imagine, and we apologize that it's going to be $4,900. So it was almost apologetic. Uh, but he was a quality builder. And he, he really cared about people, and he cared about what he built and his reputation. So uh, he and then my father and my uncle. And, my and as, you, as you were saying to me, Grandpa Hyman 
I mean, he passed on when he was 90 years of yeah. age, started the business, you know, when he was 40, continued to be involved with the business with your father and even with you. So let, let's go to the next generation. So continuing to build the, the homes in Northeast Philadelphia, your father was even born on the farm, lived on the farm, correct? Yes. My father and uncle were best friends. They weren't just brothers. They were best friends. And uh, they lived in Northeast Philadelphia and also on a farm in Bucks County, which they operated. And they really were true partners in everything they did. And they were passionate over it, and they built quality homes. And uh, as time went on, and my two cousins and I came into the business, we started to see over a period of time that I felt at least that building homes was the only business where you bet millions to make thousands because you were on the hook for those construction loans. And it only took one job not going perfect and you were in trouble. Now, you were born in 1940. 40. And you, you also are living in the farm at the beginning. You said you yes. were three years old that yes. you moved. And you were, you were going to the business with your grandfather and with your father when they were building in northeast Philadelphia because that's yes. at that time. Then you decide to go to Penn State. Yes. How come you decided to go to Penn State? I, I was interested in getting uh, my real estate and insurance license. And uh, fortunately, two of my professors were the people that actually gave you your licenses. So when you graduated, you actually had your broker's license for both insurance, and I started Northwestern Mutual Life Insurance. Right, that, and as you said in, to me, and it was in one of these articles, it said you were trying to, Northwestern, which is, in my opinion, the most finest organization around, it's a great insurance company. I've had them on my show because you know it's the quiet company, as yes. they say, and they're a great product. And you said, hey, it's going to be difficult for me to sell life insurance to an 18-year-old. Yes, that was difficult. It was a great lesson in life. Uh, you learn how to take a certain amount of rejection. You learn how to turn it around. You learn how to find the positives. And it was a great experience for me. And it was a great experience because it also took you into the business, but later in life, as opposed to starting going to work yes. for the Corman business at that time. So you're at Northwestern, and then it, then you're about 21, you graduate, and you get involved with the supply business. Yes. And, and over there, you were involved with some innovative situations with the trusses and the doors. Why don't you tell me about that? Well, what had happened, uh, homes were typically not built with wooden trusses. Uh, the original trusses that people used for commercial buildings was a Tico bolt system for a truss. We came up with Sanford and created a truss that was just pressed together and it was very strong. To get the approvals, I had to go to all the different townships and municipalities to get them approved. Today, I'd say almost 100% of homes are built with wooden trusses. And then you also, there was pre-hung doors. Factory. We created the factory that did that. We also did pre-hung doors. We had a day shift, a night shift. Uh, it was very exciting. And that, that really changed a lot of things. The other thing we try to do is always be a little different. Uh, drywall was always carried up by two people, second, third, fourth floor of a home. Uh, we put a boom on the end of our truck, and we were able to put things right into the second and third floor of the boom, and we got all the drywall business. So it was an exciting thing to do things differently. And then it's about 48 years ago, um, Grandpa was still alive. Your father was involved and you were involved. Y your father builds this building uh, in Philadelphia. Let's talk about that building, the plaza. Yes. The, the plaza uh, was a round marble building. It was a very small piece of property, very, very small. And Oscar Stanaroff, uh was really one of the top architects. And the only thing he felt would fit on this ground, it was right on the parkway, the only thing that would fit on that ground was a round building. And it was a round marble building, 300 apartments. The problem with a round marble building, a round building, is you get pie-shaped apartments that were very difficult for people to see how they could decorate them. And I'd always felt, not wanting to be what I call me too, but wanting to be different, I always felt that there was hotel rooms for a day or two days or three days, and there was apartments for a year. There was nothing in between. Someone's being divorced or someone's fixing up a home or someone's or being corporate transferred. corporate relocation, correct. There was nowhere to go, so I felt I could kill two birds with one stone. One is I could show people 
how it could be decorated by decorating the apartment for them. So we decorated the apartment. It became a huge success. And we ended up with 300 extended stay apartments. Which was truly the beginning of extended stay because one. at that time, no one really knew what the what extended stay. People, you know, they'd rent a hotel room right. or they'd rent an apartment that wasn't the extended stay. And you also took another in, uh, maneuver in the situation that you furnished these places. That's correct. They uh, furnished them and we also gave services. Uh, right, you had the Bentley Concierge. We had the so. Bentley con Concierge. Uh, we had the Continental Breakfast. We had housekeeping. So really, they were very, very comfortable, and yet they had something that was bigger than a hotel room. It was a full apartment. And at the same time, they had some of the services that they would want. It became a huge success, and all of a sudden, we took it to our other 19 communities. The 19 communities, were these were in Pennsylvania, yeah. And New York and, and New Jersey. And New Jersey, they were. Yes, New York. they were. They were Montgomery County, Bucks County, Center City, Philadelphia. Uh, they were in South Jersey, and they were huge successes. Now, in these communities, which now are called AVE, right? Basically, the community offered certain apartments which were furnished and certain apartments which were unfurnished, and apartments somebody could rent for a month or they can rent for uh, month to month and also for a year. Correct. That's correct, Michael. What we did is we had 100 to 150 of the apartments fully furnished. You got all the services you could imagine. You got the breakfast, everything. And the other 150 units were unfurnished. And they were yearly. And a lot of times people would come and they'd rent for a month or two and say, I liked it so much, I'm going to move over to these because it was much more expensive. They were paying about 2.3 times the amount for the furnished apartment as the unfurnished. And it was basically because it was a short-term lease. They were able to, after a month, walk. So if you're separated from someone or you're being transferred, you don't know how long you're going to be here. So this gave them a huge edge. And this also, as you, we were talking, is that this is a way that you were able to build up through your, your sales force this large database of corporations who would be looking. Right. We had roughly 8,000 corporations we were dealing with. And it was one of the reasons that it was difficult for competition to come in, because if you didn't have that many companies, when you call on General Electric, they're not in the apartment business. You can call them 10 times, and they don't have a need. The 11th time, they have two people moving in, and they have a need. Well, you better have a lot of General Electrics, because when 50 people move out, you have to have 50 people to move in. And we always did, because we had roughly 100 people that were outside calling. They were constantly calling on people. We had a tremendous outreach program. And we've been doing it, as I said, close to f 48 years. Now, let's talk about Lord Forte yes. on in the plaza. Tell me what you did with him. It was great. Uh, Lord, I heard Lord Forte was in New York, and I gave him a call, and I told him we have something in Philadelphia I'd love him to see. It was our plaza apartments, that round marble building. I thought it would be a gorgeous hotel. And he came in, and we walked up. He, wanted to, he didn't want to take the elevator. He wanted to walk up the fire escape, 30 floors. And we walked, and he wanted to look at everything. And I knew when he left, when he told me to deal with his executive vice president, that he was interested. So you then changed from the extended stay to a, a regular a right, hotel. palace hotel. In fact, when you went to London Heathrow, right there was a huge picture of our apartment, our Mal Hotel, Palace Hotel, and he brought the Cafe Royale from London there also. So it became really the hotel in Philadelphia. Now, when you were doing this, that you were also still continuing to build single-family homes, right? Yes. In, in different parts of Philadelphia. We built about 35,000 homes in the Philadelphia, New Jersey area. And then uh, about 20 years ago, we just decided that, you know, it wasn't where we wanted to be. It was, as I said, it was a business where you bet millions to make thousands. It was a very difficult business, unless you went public, which we didn't want to do at the time. So those Corman suites, or we mm -hmm. can call them the Corman executive stay or whatever, <laughs> executive yes. suite, they became, or what they are today is AVA. Yes. Now, later on in life, with your three sons, okay, uh, you, you subsequently create what I consider the finest, because I've seen it, the AKA. And the AKA stands for another? It, many things. Actually, uh, my oldest son, Larry, spent two years 
working very hard on what should the name be. And it goes into a lot of things. You want a short name. You'd like it to start with an A, just because it hits the alphabet much earlier. Uh, it tied into, it could be a Corman apartment. It could be many things. It could be instead of. So there were so many different plays on it, but it also looked good graphically, the AKA. It would be no different than W with the hotels. So the AK looked very good graphically, worked for us, had a, a lot of reasons. We test marketed it. They test marketed very well. And as you said to me, if you're going to be in the luxury extended stay hotel, uh, you really have to be in New York and other cities, like New York and London. So what happened? You came to New York City and you found this location near the UN? That's correct. We uh, saw something at the U near the UN that we liked. We totally renovated it. Uh, it. People love it. It's been a huge success. And since then, we're now at 58th and 5th, I close mean, on the five. plaza. We're at Times Square. Uh, we're at Sutton Place, White Plains, a block from the White House, Rittenhouse Square in Philadelphia. We've tried to get the best locations, quality products, and great service. Now, you said you're also looking for London. Four years we've been looking in London. Not easy. <laughs> it has been very difficult. Uh, the feeling with most of the people, sometimes been in their family for 600 years or something like this, and they don't sell fast. When I took the tour with you and Larry uh, a couple weeks ago, I saw the difference. I mean, it's not a hotel. There's, you know, there, there's a concierge who really sits there and takes the information as opposed to a front desk. There, there is a gym that, that is totally like being in a canyon ranch in the gym. Uh, there's a private bar or a private restaurant later on for the guests. I mean, how do you decide on these different type of amenities? What we felt was we were trying to do the high end something the equivalent of a Four Seasons as a hotel, the high end for someone who, whether they're separated, whether they're transferred, we get most of the movie stars when they come to New right, York. Right, you have a major relationship with Sony. And yes, and what happens is when they come with us, they feel the privacy, they feel they're being taken care of, the ambience of the place, and we try and think of how they would want to live. And we want to be in the right locations, and that's what we work at very hard. I, I mean, even the restaurant, that you, you have a separate section where, you know, the, the guests could be seated over there. So the, the, the situation and the, and, the, and the rooms and, you know, everything has a, a class to, to that situation. Uh, let's talk about something that, uh, you know, uh, we'll get back to the kids in a little while, but it was 2008. And Stephen Corman sees uh, Pfizer, one of the company that you bought some stock, and decides to put an ad in the New York Times and the Philadelphia Inquirer telling companies not to lay off their employees. Tell me a little bit about that. Well, it was, it was very hurtful. I'm listening to a CEO of Pfizer on TV, and he's saying, I'm cutting 8,000 jobs, and we're going to make another $2 billion. And they were making a lot of billions to start with. They weren't jobs. They were people with families. They weren't jobs. They were people with families. And I also thought it was bad business. So I wrote an article to all the CEOs of all the companies that I had stock in. And then I put an article in the paper asking people to understand that you can't get loyalty from the other employees that you keep when they see that you're willing to just cut people that are a number. You can't do that. And the good people that you want to keep would leave eventually for someone else. To create loyalty, I have no problem if someone doesn't do their job properly. But to say I'm leaving 8,000, quote, jobs go because I'm going to make another two billion, I couldn't handle that. And I think if they thought about it, they couldn't. And sure enough, many of the people, including Jeffrey Immelt from GE, sent me letters back saying, you're right. I'm, I'm glad you wrote something. I'm glad you said something. I think this, this really comes back, as you, you were saying to me, your grandfather, Hyman, gave away so much to, to help the, the unfortunate mm -hmm. person. And, you know, you following that just over there, but you've been involved. Like, let's talk about Mana. Mm -hmm. Mana is a fascinating situation. Uh, 
when people are poor and they get out of the hospital and they have a terminal disease, uh, cancer or uh, heart disease or anything, they're sent home. Now what do they do? They don't know what to do. Well, we meet with the hospital with our nutritionist. And we, we have 12 different meals depending on what your ailment is. We deliver to your house three really beautifully prepared hot meals every day, seven days a week for the rest of your life. And we have a thousand volunteers. What do the volunteers do? They do the delivery. They do the delivery and cooking. With we have a, we have about four chefs that we pay. But we have a thousand volunteers. We have hundreds of people in that kitchen working full time. I mean, we've given out hundreds of thousands of meals. And what's been wonderful is when you realize that there's 1,400 people now that we're taking care of. Let's talk about Sister Mary. Yeah. Sister Mary Scullion is a very special person. Uh, One of she the was top 50 people. In Time Magazine, the front cover. Uh, the Pope has, the, not this current Pope, the Pope before him, had already said that she's someone who could be sainted. She has really gone to a different ilk. I used to feed for 17 years the homeless. I had my own van. But I just fed them. She goes a step further. She feeds their soul. She treats them as an equal. So she's not only housing them and feeding them, she's teaching them. And she's been an inspiration. I mean, she is just one of the most special women I've ever met. So heard. Saturdays, what, what happens at well, Temple? And, uh, I read in the New York Times and uh, the Inquirer picked up the story that the poorest area in the United States was right around Temple University. I'm chairman of the school of tourism there. Northeast Philadelphia? It's not Northeast, it's North Philadelphia. North Philadelphia. North Philadelphia. And it's a tough area, but it's the poorest area. 38% of the children are malnutrition. So what we did is I met with Sister Mary, and I wanted to listen to about seven or eight of the women that had been homeless. Some of them had children. And I said, what's needed? She said, what's needed is fruit and vegetables. We don't have any place where you can buy fruit and vegetables. And if there was a place that had it, they would be brown bananas. They would be horrible. So what I simply did was I sat down with Sister Mary, and we created on Saturdays right in North Philly a farmer's market. The people that help are those eight and nine women that were homeless. And I have nine female students at Temple that come every Saturday. They help unload the trucks. They do everything. And then you sell the food to I, the community I, at a subsidized... Yeah, we charge about 10% of what it costs. So you can buy a whole thing of apples for 25 cents. And it's just to give people a feeling like they're buying it and everything. And if someone doesn't have that, that's all right, too. And it's been a huge success. Uh, I get more out, I guess, than anyone when I'm there because there's a lot of hugging that goes around and a lot of caring. And I guess the biggest thing for me is, and I said to these young girls, you know, you're 20 and 21 and you're already learning about life because you're working with people that, are, that were homeless and they had another experience. And you, the two of you get along so beautifully, all of them. So the interaction's been unbelievable. And, you know, when you bring out hugging, I think that is a practice of the Corman family. I think, uh, and it's literally, you know, I've known Larry only a couple of months and I know you only about a month. The, the relationship and the warmth of the hugging, because that's exactly how it is. And, you know, you have three sons. Yeah. Tell me about the three sons, your daughter-in-laws and the grandchildren. So okay. you have Larry. And Larry, Brad, and Mark. Larry's and the oldest. Larry's the oldest, then Brad, then Mark. The interesting thing is all three uh, all went to Duke. They all went to Duke. And you were the chairman of the library at Duke. Yes. And, Bra uh, and Larry and Brad are co-presidents of AKA yes. Hotels. Larry's married to... Larry's married to Corinne, Brad to Pam, and, Mark and Mark's married to Kelly, and Mark's president of our commercial division. Right, which does other things yes. besides the extended... Shopping state, centers. The shopping centers yes. and industrial yes. properties. And um, grandchildren, Larry? Larry has three children that I think are really special. Alex with me today, and uh, Nikki and Max, and Brad has uh, three children also. And uh, he's got Jackson and Sam, who was named after my father, and Olivia. And then and Mark has... Mark has Cameron and, and Quinn. Quinn. Right. And they're all very special people. And, and you are married to? 
Jennifer. Jennifer. The and Jennifer's great. And, you know, I think our camaraderie of everyone together, we really respect each other. I think that's the whole trick in life is just respecting each other and, and, and you not know, just the age. What you also did, you know, when we were talking about Mana, we were talking about Sister Mary, but Temple University, the hospitality program. Yes. Tell me a little bit about that. Well, it's unbelievable. Uh, what's happened there, uh, 12 years ago, we started the hospitality program. And Moshe Parat is the dean and Betsy Barber, the associate dean. And what's so amazing is there was Cornell and everyone else. Today, internationally, I think it's Temple because we have the top research program in the world. We've got the best doctorate program as well as the masters and undergrad. And we're in uh, Rome, we're in Singapore, we're in Japan, we're uh, in Israel, we're in Paris. So it's, it's very exciting. And what's been going on, what we're most proud of in 12 years, we have on average about seven, 800 students per year. When they graduate, they 100% have been offered a job. 100%. And as you were saying to me before, few people realize that the number one business in the world is hospitality. Yeah, the number one in, business in, in the different world. forms of hospitality. And this way, you're training people and you're giving them undergraduate, graduate, and postgraduate yes. degrees over there. You know, you brought out the fact that Israel, you've also had a tie to Israel with Technion. Yeah, I was president of Technion, and uh, we were very fortunate. We had Barbara Walters one year uh, spoke to our group. And uh, she was kind of emotional about her speech because she says, I don't get an opportunity like this where she could describe what she felt. And also, I guess, a little bit of myth she was Jewish at the same time, you know. But it was a, it was a wonderful experience. Uh, Technion, what I guess is unique about Technion is they, they created leaders that were able to come up with such things in technology that Israel just per capita produces more technology than anywhere else in the world, per capita. So as I was saying to, to uh, Alex before, you know, there, there, are, there have been four generations of Cormans, and as you said to me, you never told the boys that they should join the business, but they all wanted to join the business in different levels. And I think based on what I see and what I feel with the Cormans, there's going to be a fifth generation, and I'm really happy that you were here today. I want to thank you so much, Michael. Your, your show's an inspiration. And, you know, what can I say? There's one New York, and you're the man. <laughs> Thanks for being here. Thank you very much. Thank you. Major support for these programs is provided by Bank of America, Merrill Lynch, and Perfect Building Maintenance, New York Community Bank, All Nation Renovation, Kilroy Architectural Windows, New York's Window Company, Greenberg Traurig, LLP, m and Bank. Additional support is provided by AVR Realty Company, LLC, Ackman Ziff Real Estate Group, LLC, Bingham McCutcheon, LLP, Briarwood Organization, Capital One Bank, C.B. Richard Ellis, James Orfanides, Centurion Holdings, Cushman and Wakefield, Dimes Savings Bank of Williamsburg, Douglaston Development, DDG Partners, Eastern Consolidated, Hal Fetner, Durst Fetner Residential, Friedman, LLP, Accountants and Advisors, Gemini Real Estate Advisors, LLC, Genova, Burns and Gian Tomasi, Grubb and Ellis, Investors Savings Bank, Jack Jaffa and Associates Real Estate Consultants, James D. Kuhn Real Estate Institute at Syracuse University, Madison Realty Capital, Massey Knackle Realty Services, Meridian Capital Group, Margolin Weiner and Evans, LLP, Certified Public Accountants and Business Advisors, Newmark Knight Frank, RAL Development Services, The Spandrel Group, LLC, Siami Development, SJP Properties, Site Comply, Sterling and Sterling, Stephen Napolitano, The Wickhoff Group, Urban American.